All right, so uh, in the morning lecture, I talked about there being two different uh, main styles of analysis to do. One is based on mapping reads to a reference genome, and the other is uh, when you don't have a reference genome, or for some reason you don't want to use the reference genome, uh, to perform a genome assembly, um, which we call a de novo assembly, as you're trying to construct the genome uh, from scratch without using uh, anything but the reads themselves. <clears throat> so again, credit to Ben and Aaron. Uh, this is going to be uh, maybe about 45 minutes, depending on questions, uh, about the theory of how we assemble genomes. And then after that, we're going to have a chance to run uh, different assembly software for, uh, for short reads, like Illumina reads, and then some long read data sets uh, as well. Now you might think, why are we teaching genome assembly in a cancer genomics? Uh, workshop, it's a good question, um, but a lot of bioinformatics analysis are starting to incorporate genome assembly uh, in some way or another. So even if you're not constructing a reference genome uh, from scratch, a lot of the modern uh, Indel and structural variation callers will have a genome assembly step built in, which we call a local assembly, where they'll take the reads that might indicate some type of structural variation and do a little assembly of just those reads uh, in place. So it's a, good, uh, it's a good idea to understand you know, what we're talking about when we mean genome assembly and what some of the key algorithms and key ideas are uh, for reconstructing genomes. <clears throat> okay, that's okay, interruptions are fine. So, like this morning what we did is we looked at mapping, so basically you have your normal genome, you have your cancer genome, Right, so Francis's question, I think the essence of it is um, when would we want to use genome assembly for analyzing cancer genomes versus, you know, traditional reference-based methods where we map reads like we did in the uh, morning lecture. For simple somatic substitutions where it's just one base that's different, um, almost always reference-based alignment is going to work better. Uh, and people really got interested in the idea of using genome assembly um, for cancer variant calling because of the limitations of finding large insertions and deletions from aligning reads to a reference genome. So there's a fairly popular tool called Scalpel, uh, which uses a local de novo, uh, de novo assembly step to try to improve the uh, accuracy and sensitivity of finding these larger types of uh, variation. And the general principle, the way that we think about this is that the more, the more messed up, as Francis said, or the mere, more the higher level of difference between the samples that you have and your reference genome, the better it's going to be to do uh, a de novo assembly. A lot of the methods are still in development, and when we talk about long reads, uh, maybe I can touch on this as well, but sort of the, the uh, direction that the computational genomics field is moving in, like what my group works on, is trying to take this assembly first approach where we're going to do uh, genome assembly and then analyze the assembled genomes rather than comparing to the reference genome. So is there a metric to this messed up index we're talking about? Yeah. Is there a certain level where yeah, you don't really know ahead of time. You don't really know ahead of time, you know, is this a, is this a tumor that's really structure variation versus point mutations? Uh, the common, you know, common bioinformatics practice is to not just run one variant caller on your sample, but run many different variant callers and see how they compare to each other and see if the results are consistent uh, across different variant callers. <clears throat> Excuse me. In a, we, I was involved in a project called Pan Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes. For that project, we ran four different variant callers for each class of mutation: somatic substitutions, insertion, deletions, structure variation, and then we 
uh, made a consensus call set out of the four different approaches that tried to balance the strength and weaknesses of alignment-based versus assembly-based and so on. All right, so what is genome assembly? What does it mean when we talk about genome assembly? So again, I'm going to come back to my cartoon genome here uh, where there's three repeats shown in red. Now, when we sequence our genome, we randomly fragment the genome into many, many pieces, and we uh, put those pieces onto our DNA sequencing instrument, which determines the uh, sequence of each one of those individual fragments. Now, conceptually, the genome assembly process uh, is really uh, quite simple to think about in that we're trying to reverse this process and take our sequence fragments and just reconstruct our genome uh, from scratch. So we're just trying to use our individual sequencing reads and how they relate to each other, like how they overlap, uh, to infer what the sequence uh, of our genome is. Now the analogy that I like to use is if I went down to uh, the newsstand, bought a hundred copies of today's newspaper, put them through a paper shredder, uh, put them in a big pile in the middle of this room, and then had you guys all look at how the different pieces of that shredded newspaper uh, had, had similar sentences, and then tried to reconstruct the newspaper from end to end. I'm not going to do that. But we're going to use software uh, to do something very similar, which is taking sequencing data and trying to assemble genomes instead. All right, so the lecture is going to have three parts. Uh, I'm going to first talk about, uh, at a high level, how assemblers work, some of the algorithms that go into assemblers. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the differences between assembly algorithms for short and long reads. Uh, and then finally, uh, talk a little bit, very briefly, about some of the features of genomes that make uh, assembly a difficult problem and really highlight why we can't just get end-to-end -end reconstructions of genomes, uh, which is what we uh, would really like to do. Yeah? If you're doing an NGS that's being targeted, yeah. you wouldn't do a genome assembly. No, you, you, for any sort of targeted sequencing, you, can, you typically can't do genome You'd assembly. Use your bed reference, right? You'd use your reference, exactly. Um, you might do a little bit of local assembly within that region, like some of the variant callers, a popular a uh, popular method of calling germline SNPs and indels is called the GATK haplotype caller. It does a local genome assembly uh, internally uh, using some of the methods that we're going to be talking about here today. But typically when we talk about you know, doing a genome assembly, it's uh, what we call whole genome shotgun sequencing, where you take the entire genome, fragment it randomly, determine the identity of each individual fragment, and then try to put them back together. All right, perfect lead into whole genome shotgun assembly. Here's what we, uh, here's how we depict whole genome sequence uh, shotgun sequencing. We have our input genome, which is shown in light red here. We take many copies of that genome, and then we fragment those copies into smaller individual pieces, determine the identity of those pieces, which we call sequence reads, and then we want to reconstruct this input <laughs> sequence uh, from these fragments. Now, if we knew an ordering of these fragments from left to right, like the, this, these three fragments were all taken from the beginning of the genome, this fragment was taken from the fifth position, this fragment was taken from the ninth position, and so on, we could just line them up and read off the bases from these columns of this alignment here. And that would give us back our genome sequence. It would be really conceptually quite straightforward to assemble a genome if we know the ordering of those reads. Unfortunately, we don't know the ordering of the reads. The sequencer just outputs uh, an individual sequence fragment, and we don't know how those reads relate to each other. So we need to design computational algorithms to try to infer the ordering of those reads uh, along our, uh, our, our uh, input source genome. Now, a key term that we use when we talk about genome assembly is coverage. Um, we talked a little bit about this or touched on it in the morning when we were looking at pileup of bases. The coverage at an individual base is how many reads are contributing to that pileup. So for example, uh, the coverage at this C here is six, as we have six reads crossing this position. Typically for genome assembly, we aim for coverage of around 30x, which means that on average, each base of our uh, input genome is present in about 30 reads. The reason coverage is so important is if you have higher coverage, the reads are going to overlap more, and if you have longer overlaps, it's easier to assemble uh, your target genome. 
Right, so the basic principle behind assembly is that we can compare the reads to each other to look for similarity between pairs of reads. So the more similar two reads are, uh, the more likely they are to have come from some the same position on your uh, input genome. So here's an example of two reads where the start of this read, which starts T-A-T-C-T, -T, matches the end of this read, which also has this T-A-T-C-T -T stretch, but there's a little individual difference in here, which is fine. So what we call these as overlapping reads. An overlap is where the end of one read matches the beginning of another read. Any questions? Yeah, um, the last slide is um, pile up the same thing as read depth. Yeah, so in your, in your pileup, the number of bases you have in the pileup is your read depth of that position. <clears throat> so here, you know, the pileup is C, 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 C. So uh, our pileup contains six bases. Our depth of that position is six. I think we have somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just, just talking again about the coverage of the read. Um, you were saying 30 is a good amount. Yeah. Are we talking exactly the same base pair? Are we talking something like with the cigar reference from before where it's like the C of the read? Yeah, that's a good question. Usually, the way that we uh, uh, calculate coverage is that we, cal we uh, sum up the total number of bases in our sequencing data. So the luminous sequencing run is maybe 100 gigabases. And then we divide that by the size of our reference genome which uh, for human genome is about 3 billion bases. So that would be coverage of about 33.3 repeating. Um, so it's an average measure across the, entire, uh, across the entire genome. When we're talking about you know, an individual pileup like here, we would say coverage six. If one of these reads had a deletion in it, we would probably say that there's still coverage six. It's just that there was a read crossing that position, but there was no base uh, observed for that nucleotide. Um, yeah, we could talk about, you know, genome coverage, we would probably divide by 3 billion bases. If we wanted to talk about haplotype coverage, we would divide by 6 billion bases. So if you, if you sequence the human genome to 30x, you'll have 15x coming from the paternal set of chromosomes, 15x coming from the maternal set of chromosomes. Often in assembly, as I'll, I'll describe later, uh, we try to ignore the allelic differences between chromosomes for diploid genomes uh, as they complicate things. But with long reads, we're starting to look at uh, things like phasing uh, simultaneously with genome assembly where this sort of consideration matters. All right, any, any more questions about coverage or read overlaps before we move on? These are all good questions, good discussion. All right, so what we're looking for are these overlapping reads, where the end of one read matches the beginning of another read, as high levels of sequence similarity between overlapping read might indicate that they come from the same position of our genome, and then we can just merge the sequences together to do a little assembly uh, of that region of the genome. If we do this for all reads, uh, we, we can come up with a reconstruction of our genome. Now, we haven't talked about long read sequencing very much, so maybe I'll pause here uh, to talk about the main types of long read sequencers. So who, who's familiar with PacBio sequencer or Oxford nanopore sequencing? Has anybody looked at PacBio or Oxford nanopore data before? No? Nobody, nobody's had long read sequencing? Right, so um, long read sequencing became available in around, let's say, 2013 when the PacBio uh, RS sequencer came out. Uh, they sequence single molecules of DNA instead of having this amplification step like Illumina has where you amplify this cluster uh, into this uh, colony of clones, uh, they sequence just individual fragments of DNA. Uh, and they, uh, this allows them to sequence really, really long fragments of DNA up to 10,000 bases in length. When we talked about these repeat problems, problems that repeats uh, give us, a lot of the Repeats in human genomes are between 500 and a few thousand bases. So if you have a read that's in, set in excess of 10,000 bases, you can cross over or span those repeats. Um, one of the drawbacks of long read sequencing is because they're working off the single molecules, the signal uh, that the base caller uses tends to be much weaker, so the error rate's a lot higher at around 5 to 15%, as opposed to about uh, you know, 0.1% for luminous sequencing. So the algorithms that we use for assembling long reads are very, very different than the algorithms we're going to use for 
uh, short reads because the read length is longer, because the error rate is so much higher. So all of the software that we used this morning, like BWMM, that's optimized for long reads, or sorry, short reads. When we're going to use long reads in the uh, in the lab section for this module, we'll be using an entirely different set of software that we'll describe later. All right, so the key computational challenge for long reads is overcoming the high error rate. Uh, the key computational challenge for short reads is trying to efficiently assemble the extremely large numbers of these short reads that uh, Illumina sequencing uh, generates. The reason I'm describing this is that I'm going to describe an assembly pipeline for long reads and then contrast it to an assembly pipeline for short reads, which uses very different methods. All right, any questions about long read sequencing technology before I go on? I'm generally happy with that. It's just longer reads. Pretty easy to get your head around. Um, all right, so here's the long read assembly pipeline. So we have reads at the beginning. We then uh, construct what we call an overlap graph. Where we're going to find these pairs of reads that have similar uh, starts and ends. We're then going to process the graph in a step that we call the layout step, where we try to find this ordering of reads through the graph that reconstructs the genome. We're then going to call a consensus sequence to uh, pick the most likely nucleotide for each base of our pileup, and then we're going to output those uh, as context. And I'm going to describe each one of these steps uh, individually. So the overlap step, uh, we take each one of our reads and we compare them to every other read to look for regions where the end of our read matches the beginning of another read. And we're going to construct a graph where each vertex or each node in the graph is represented, uh, represents a read. And we're going to draw an arc from one read to the other read if they share an overlap. So this read shares an overlap with this read. So we've drawn an arc between them, showing that we could travel from this read to this read to make a walk along our genome. Now, if we do this for every read, we end up with a graph that looks like this. This is an example overlap graph for seven base pair reads, where we require a three base pair overlap to uh, link them up with an edge. And we can see this graph isn't so complicated. We can make a walk through the graph, which maybe reconstruct part of our genome sequence. And each edge is labeled with uh, the length of the overlap between them. So the last five bases of this read a, T, T, A, T, match the first five bases of this read, A, T, T, A, T. So this is a representation that your genome assembly software is going to use uh, to try to reconstruct the genome. All right, so that's the overlap stage. Next, the assembler is going to uh, try to compute this layout where it's going to try to bundle stretches of the overlap graph together into context. Now, I think it's easier to um, understand genome assembly if we uh, move away from A, C, G's, and T's for a minute and just use a fragment from a song. So uh, this song says to everything, turn, 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 there's a season. The reason that we selected this fragment is because this uh, word here, turn, is going to stand in for a genomic repeat. So it's present in multiple copy and allows us to visualize uh, what happens to an overlap graph uh, when there's repeats in it. So here's the overlap graph that we constructed using the same technique as before, where we just break it up into seven character fragments, which overlap by three characters. And it's pretty complicated. Uh, and just looking at this, it's not apparent uh, what that fragment of a song uh, might be. Yeah? Is this using some kind of, just looking at it, it reminds me of like a push down, like a automaton or something like this. Is this using like some kind of like context-free grammar language to process this, the algorithm? So. It's yeah, it, it, it's similar to those sort of techniques um, where we're representing sort of this uh, the relationship between these sequences as a graph. Um, but the, the techniques that we use to construct this graph aren't really you know traditional parsers of context-free grammars, but uh, string matching algorithms where we'll process, we'll generate an index of our data and then search that index to look for reads that might share a sequence, and then use dynamic programming to determine whether they, they share a similarity or not. So it's sort of like the same, it's a similar class of algorithms, but more, um, you know, we don't, we don't really know the structure of, of the strings, so we need to be more 
you know, more, uh, more permissive in what we allow into the graph, if that makes sense. All right, so we've arrived at this assembly graph, and what we need to do then, or what the assembler needs to do, um, is try to clean up the graph to make the structure of the genome more apparent. And the first step it's going to do is look for what we call transitive edges in the graph. And a transitive edge is an edge that bypasses a node that looks like this. Now, these, the genome assembler is going to consider these edges redundant as the path spelled by this sequence is the exact same as the path spelled by this sequence. So the green edges can all be removed without changing uh, the uh, possible reconstructions of the genomes from this graph. So we're going to remove these edges that bypass one node, and we're going to graph, get a graph that looks like this. It's a lot cleaner, and the structure of the genome uh, is suddenly becoming apparent. And we can go a step further and remove uh, edges through the graph that skip two nodes that look like this, and now we have this really nice graph which has this linear chain of nodes here and a linear chain of nodes here with something complicated going on in the middle here. Now what the assembler is going to do is it's, it can't resolve this genome any further, so it's going to take these linear stretches, assemble them together by merging the reads, and output a contig for each one of these linear unbranched nodes. And what we have is one contig which says to everything turn, and then another contig in purple here which is turn, there's a season, and then this part in the red box here is an unresolvable repeat. So using these little seven, ba seven character fragments, we don't know how many times the word turn should appear in this reconstruction. So what the assembler's done is that it's built the graph, found this looping structure which represents a repeat, it can't resolve how many times to traverse that structure, so it just gives up and outputs these linear segments. And that's exactly how genome assemblers that you'll run uh, on sequencing data after this lecture operate. They're building a graph, performing these transformations to make it simpler, and then outputting these unambiguously assemblable sequences. Any questions about that formula? So this is really the fundamental step in the assembler. We build this graph, clean it up, output contigs. All right, so the third step in overlap, overlap layout consensus uh, assembly pipeline for long reads is picking uh, the final sequence of our contig. So this is really just looking at each base of a pileup. So we take all the reads that are assembled into one contig, we look at the pileup for each one, and we're going to pick the most frequently observed base uh, at each part of that pileup. So if we look here, there's a sequencing error where there's a T here, four reads showed a C at this position, one read showed a T, so we output a C here because it's the most frequently observed base in that pileup. And we just do that from column to column all the way along our pileup to output uh, our final genome assembly sequence. And because we're, we're taking, uh, we're treating each read as, it, as if it has a vote for what the final sequence is, and we take the majority vote, so we call this the consensus algorithm. So taking a majority vote across all of the reads for each base of our contig uh, to get our final genome assembly. Is each read a different sample? Uh, each read is going to be um, from the same genome, ideally. So you, you take you know, a large collection of cells extracted from, let's say, a blood sample of one individual. Uh, you then uh, extract DNA from those cells. Uh, they all should have the same genome, so each of them is an independent observation of the same genome. So can you inform the, uh, the algorithm that you're dealing with uh, every human cell population? Um, traditional genome assemblers up to maybe five years ago tried to ignore anything like heterozygosity or you know, low-frequency subclonal somatic mutations, and it would just output the majority base. Yeah. So modern genome assemblers will try to re preserve those distinctions, and instead of just outputting a single majority base, they'll try to say, you know, 80% of the reads were C here, 20% of the reads were T, or, or whatever it may be. They'll try to, to, to uh, represent as much of the difference as possible. Um, they'll also try to phase individual haplotypes as well, uh, if you have long enough reads. All right. 
<clears throat> so this is this method of assembly, which we call the overlap layout consensus paradigm of assembly, uh, was developed for Sanger sequencing, uh, you know, many decades ago. Uh, when Illumina sequencing first became available, people tried to apply these methods, where we look for overlaps between reads, uh, to short read data. And long story, sh long story short, they basically failed miserably. Uh, the number of reads and the number of overlapping reads that you get from a Illumina run uh, caused the assembly graphs to be far too large. They would have hundreds of billions, if not a trillion nodes in the graph, and they'd basically exhaust uh, the available memory uh, that you have to do the genome assembly. And that's even if you can compute the, the overlaps themselves. So for short reads, uh, we had to develop entirely new classes of algorithms to deal with uh, the volumes of data that Illumina sequencing uh, produced. And what I worked on uh, when I was at the Genome Sciences Center in Vancouver and for my PhD at the Sanger Institute was uh, assembly algorithms um, for short read sequencing data. Right, so here's the uh, overview of a short read assembly pipeline. We're going to first uh, introduce a novel step, which we call error correction, where we're going to take the reads, try to identify sequencing errors, and fix them. We're then going to build an assembly graph. Uh, we're then going to perform what we call a graph cleaning step, where we remove artifacts from that graph. We're then going to build contigs and then try to scaffold the contigs uh, together using paired end information. Right, so the reason we need to, need to do correction, or why it's a good idea, is that we want to overcome this error profile from Illumina sequencing. So I mentioned uh, when I introduced Illumina sequencing this morning that the error rate increases towards the three prime end of the read. Uh, this is exactly the plot that I wanted to show you. So this is six different uh, whole genome sequencing data sets that were part of an assembly project called the Assemblathon. Come back to that a little bit later. We had a small yeast genome, uh, a Lake Malawi cichlid genome, a fish, boa constrictor snake, human genome, uh, parakeet, uh, and not part of a semathon, but an interesting data set was this oyster data set. And what we're plotting here is the average error rate for these six different data sets as a function of where in the read the bases are. So we see that for the very beginning of the reads, uh, the error rate's really quite low, below 0 0.005 or 1 in 200 base pair errors. But for all of the data sets, as you get towards the three prime end of the read, particularly, say, for this fish data set, we see the error rate spiking. That's because of these phasing problems in Illumina sequencing, where uh, the individual molecules within a cluster uh, get out of sync. So some, some data sets in this uh, example were longer reads, uh, not long reads, but slightly longer short reads, uh, which went up to about 150 bases. Uh, the snake data set was about 120 bases and had pretty good error profile. But you can see there's this variation in error profile across data set, uh, across read length, uh, but the general uh, trend is the same, where the error rate increases towards the three prime end. Yeah? So, one quick question. Can you have, for example, the kind of question you talked about behavior of those error graphs? Is that the number of the errors, for example, just has kind of constraints on it? Uh, the, the, so, are you asking, like, why we see this, this increase? For example, yeah, for example, for the, the, the green one, they are just yeah. like it has a symptomatic behavior. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why the curve has this shape. Um, I, you know, it looks like it's some sort of exponential process where more and more molecules get out of sync, and then that, that just compounds as the error rate sort of skyrockets towards the end. Uh, but you know, some of them, you know, like this snake data set in red. Uh, has a pretty, you know, it, it's not so drastic. So there's some there's some differences between the samples that cause it to rise more sharply or or uh, more gradually, and I'm not really sure what you know what what exactly that is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Does it have anything to do with the fact that maybe this this size is only that long as a frame on average? You know, when you're looking at some data, you go to 300 cycles, but your size is right. Is yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, if you if you read off the end of the DNA fragment, which I think is possible, you know, that's that's going to cause all sorts of weird artifacts, um, like like what we're seeing where the error rate spikes. 
there are adapters as well, so you can read into the adapter sequences. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you overshoot all of that, I, I definitely think weird things would happen. Did you have a question? Yeah, do you know if this has been like replicated with multiple of the same uh, organism type? Like, if we were to do this, but with like 30 different snakes, do you think we would see the same trend that somebody does something? The general trend of you know the the, the error rate increasing the three prime end is universal across basically all Illumina data sets. You know if if all snake genomes are going to sequence slightly better than all you know bird genomes, I wouldn't expect that. Um, error rate does depend on things like GC content. So, you know some some uh, some organisms might be friendlier to sequence than others. Classic one that's really really difficult to sequence is, is Plasmodium falciparum, a malaria parasite. It's about 80% AT, which gives a lot of problems for, for uh, short read sequencing because of these amplification steps. Um, but yeah, I think, the, I think the snake genome in this case was actually sequenced at Illumina, um, where you know the techs are very, very good. They have tons of experience. So that might be why, why it's a little bit lower here. Um, you know, the, some of this is not just like genome to genome variation, but sequencing center to sequencing yeah, center. Thing, if you were to do it multiple organisms, I was wondering kind of how much yeah. of this would be like batch effect. Right, right, yeah. I think a lot of it is like, you know, driven by the sequencing center. A lot of these runs are, you know, there are multiple sequencing runs that went into the data set. So some of them will be averaged over multiple runs. Some might be from one run. This data is also like really quite old now. I think this was generated in probably, um, I'd say 2013. So, you know, a modern Illumina NovaSeq run is probably a little bit better, if not a lot better than this. All right, all good questions. We have... Do we have any others? I thought maybe I saw another hand somewhere. All right, so let's move on then. <clears throat> so error correction. Uh, so what we want to do is overcome this error rate and try to uh, correct as much of the read as possible. So the way error correction works is that we use a technique called Kamer counting, where we're going to take a fixed length substring of our reads, and we're going to count how many times that fixed length substring occurs across our entire data set. Now the reason that we do this is that for Illumina data, we expect most of the read to be error free. And if we take a small enough uh, Kamer size or fragment size, uh, it's likely that that, that Kamer is error free and seen many, many times across our entire data set. So by counting the number of times a Kamer occurs, we can classify whether a Kamer contains a sequencing error or whether it's perfectly error free. So, in this picture, I've uh, introduced a sequencing error, which is this red C here. If we count these short camers, this is a 21 base pair camer um, that contains no errors, we're probably going to see it about 40 times, depending on what our sequencing coverage is. If we count the camer that contains that sequencing error, sequencing errors are going to take a, uh, a true genomic camer and flip it to a camer that's probably only seen a single time across our entire data set. So if we count how many times this camer occurs, it's probably only going to be seen a single time across the entire read set. So we can identify by just counting the number of times this short substring occurs, whether a camer contains an error or not. Once we identify these camers that are only present once across our entire data set, we would then search for replacements, like switching this C to perhaps a G, that would change that from a low frequency camer to a high frequency camer. Now, this was a very popular bioinformatics algorithm to, uh, to write into software, and there's, I've only listed seven here, there's probably dozens of different error correctors that are based on this principle of ca counting cameras. So Quake was one of the first ones, SGA has a camera corrector, uh, SGA is a program I wrote as a PhD student, Soap De Novo, BFC, uh, Bless, Lighter, Must, Get, are all camera-based error correctors that can take just a set of sequencing reads without a reference genome and fix the majority of the sequencing errors uh, in your reads. Now once we've corrected errors, just like an overlap layout consensus assembly, we need to construct an assembly graph. Now the assembly graphs that we're going to use for short read assembly are very different than uh, for long read assembly in that we're again going to use the idea of breaking up our reads into short segments called camers to construct what we call a de Brown graph. Who's ever heard of the term de Brown graph before? A few people, a few people in the back. So the de Brown graph was developed by a computer scientist uh, named Pavel Pesner. Uh, he developed the de Brown graph in 2001 as a way of 
more efficiently assembling Sanger sequencing data. The te technique didn't really get widely adopted until we had these very high volumes of short reads and then uh, computer scientists like myself and Pavel uh, realized that there's uh, you could do genome assembly of short reads much, much faster than overlap layer consensus assembly. So basically the entire field of short read assembly uh, adopted this idea of breaking up your reads into k-mers and constructing the brown graphs to vastly accelerate assembly of short reads. So the way the brown graph assembler works is it takes your reads and you pick a k-mer size. In this case we're going to use k equals 4. And you slide this k-mer size window over your read and you add every, every k-mer that you've seen into the graph as a vertex. So the first k-mer, the first four base pair substring of this read is CCGT. So we're going to add it to, this, uh, to the graph as a vertex here. The next k-mer is CGTT. We're going to add it to this vertex here. And then GTTA, we're going to add it to the vertex here. Then get over to this read, add TTAC to, to the graph, and so on until every distinct k-mer that we've found in our read set is present as a vertex in the graph. What we're then going to do is make another pass over our reads and look for k-mers that are adjacent in a read and link them up with an edge. So in this read, the first k-mer, CCGT, is followed by the k-mer, CGTT, so we'd add an edge between this node and this node. And we're going to do that for all k-mers in our reads, and we're going to end up with this structure of the graph. Now, already this graph is a lot cleaner than when we saw for overlap layout consensus assembly. When we constructed that graph for overlap layout consensus assembly, there were hundreds of nodes, um, you know, thousands of edges, even for very, very small graphs. Whereas for this de Brown graph, we have this really nice structure where we can just read off the sequence of the genome by following the graph along this path, going back around to this node again for a second time, and then following on this path. And there's one unique traversal which spells out the simple, uh, the genome for this simple toy example. Now the reason I put the CGTT node in red is it's standing in for a genomic repeat here. It's present twice, which is why we have two edges coming into this and two edges coming out. And the main, the main algorithmic feature of the de Brown graph is this very compact, uh, the small representation, efficient representation of repeats in our graph, where we just have a few edges coming in and a few edges going out. And that's what makes it so fast uh, and why we've chosen to use this for short read assembly. Right, any questions about the brown graph before we go on? Yeah? Well, we do. We, we have multiple errors leaving it, one here. Because the, um, for each pair of camers, there's only four possible camers before it, one where it's A, C, G, and T, and four possible camers coming out of it. So you can only have four incoming edges and four outgoing edges for every node in your de Brown graph. And that constrains it to be, you know, at, at most four edges in and out, which is why it's so compact to represent repeats. Because it's not every individual read that has those camers, it's just, is this kamer followed by this kamer in, in any read? So if you have the sequence of CGTT appear multiple times in your read? Yeah. And we have that because here's one CGTT and here it is CGTT. Once it's followed by A, which gives us this branch of the graph, once it's followed by C, uh, which gives us this branch of the graph. And the, it can only be followed by A, C, G, or T, so there can only be four possible edges coming out. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It doesn't contribute anything new to the graph. You're only seeing if, you know, if this kamer is followed by this kamer in any reads. If it's there once or if it's there a hundred times, it doesn't matter. So what you'll usually do is you'll count, you'll, you'll put a count of the number of times it's been observed on the edge, and then you can see, okay, there was a hundred reads with evidence for this edge, or there was only one read with evidence for this edge. Sorry, yeah. It's not going to try to assemble it to 100 copies in the genome. Because we've sequenced the genome to 30x coverage or 100x coverage, 
you don't want you know as many copies in your genome as you've observed in the reads because your reads are oversampling the genome because you have this you know for any position of the genome we have 30 reads or 100 reads depending on how much sequencing you did so a unique stretch of your genome should only have coverage 30 or 100 does that make sense you're not trying yeah it's you the, the edge counts the number of times you observe it it's indicating how many times that that sequence is present in the genome, but it's not exactly indicating it. So you can't say, if you've seen that 100 times, it's not going to be a 100 copy repeat. So basically, I guess what I'm asking is, this can handle repeated sequences? Yes. Yeah. All right, so next we want to clean up the graph. Um, <clears throat> so there are different artifacts and it can, can appear in a de Brown graph. Uh, the first artifact that we uh, have to clean up are called tips. So if we have some residual sequencing errors, as shown by these red bases here and here, they can cause these spurs or tips off the graph where we have this little short branch uh, that doesn't go anywhere. It's not connected on both sides. So this branch is created by this sequencing error, and this branch of four nodes is created by this sequencing error. So what we want to do is process our graph to try to clean these up by removing these tips. Second type of uh, graph artifact that we can have is caused by allelic variation. So human genomes are diploid. If we um, are looking at the assembly graph of a part of the genome that has a heterozygous SNP, the graph is going to have what we call a bubble structure, where there's a divergence where one half follows one allele, let's say the C allele, and the other half follows uh, the other parental allele, which is a G in this case. Um, now, traditional assemblers, you know, five years ago, wanted to try to remove these to just give us this nice clean linear structure of the graph, uh, which is what we want for uh, assembling contigs. But more recently, assemblers are trying to preserve this structure, like what we talked about when, uh, from a question Francis had, where we want to use this as evidence that there was a heterozygous SNP or maybe some subclonal mutation uh, at this position of the graph. One of my grad students actually works on this, using these structures in the graph to try to find uh, variation in cancer. His name's Alistair. Right, so after we've assembled, um, we've, we've built our assembly graph, we might get strong something like this. We then want to try to clean up these structures. So first what we're going to do is identify all of the ending points of the graph. These are nodes that only have a connection on one end. We're then going to walk backwards until we find the point where they've diverged from the graph, and we're going to just prune those off, a process we call tip removal. We're then going to look for these bubbles in the graph, and look for where they branch and then come back together. And typically we'll remove one half of the bubble uh, to collapse it down to a single path uh, to make the structure of the genome more clear. Uh, following that, we're just going to assemble contigs by merging together all of these unbranched segments of the graph uh, and outputting them in a FASTify, which is your genome assembly. All right, finally, um, at this point, we haven't used our paired end information. We talked a lot about paired end reads uh, in the morning. So the last stage of assembly is a process called scaffolding, where we're going to use our pairing information to try to jump over unresolved repeats. So if we have one of these branching structures in the graph that the assembler can't get over, sometimes we'll have reads that can bypass that using the pairing information uh, to, try to um, <clears throat> try to bridge that repeat. So we call this scaffolding. Scaffolding, we align all of our reads back to our genome, our genome assembly, and then we're going to draw an arc between two read pairs. And when one set of reads aligns to the end of one contig and its pairs aligns to the end of another contig, we've colored them with either blue, red, this sort of dark purple is probably hard to see, uh, or this darker green. So by observing that there's this cluster of reads uh, that aligns the end of this contig, and its pairs all align to the start of this contig, we can say confidently that they're probably uh, adjacent to each other in our final genome assembly. So we can construct what we call a scaffold graph, where we're going to take contigs, put an arc between them if they have these pairing relationships, and then we can finally uh, assemble them together where we're going to fill in the gaps with these N characters, which we saw in the sequencing reads before, which we, means we don't know the exact identity of the nucleotides in between these scaffolds. We just know that they're followed by each other uh, on our genome. <clears throat> and finally, 
we can use a program called gap filling that we shall try to do uh, a little local assembly of these gap sequences to try to close them or sometimes you can use long read sequences as well to try to fill in these gaps between your scaffolds. All right, so what can you expect from the output of your genome assembly? We're going to see this later on. So if you're sequencing bacterial genomes, which are only a few megabases in size, uh, for short reads, you're probably going to get a few hundred contigs, where your contig length is about 10,000 to 100,000 bases. Uh, for long reads, where the read length is maybe 10,000 bases, you'll typically assemble bacterial genome to a few contigs, which are megabase in length, uh, and often you can assemble the bacterial genome back into a single contig that covers uh, your target genome from end to end. If you try to assemble a large genome, like a human genome, with short reads your contigs will be around 10,000 bases in length. With long reads, maybe a megabase, even up to 10 megabases now, uh, with an improvement to long read uh, genome assembly. Uh, the drawback is that traditionally long read data is more expensive, PacBio and Nanopore data uh, is a few times more expensive than sequencing a whole genome using Illumina, which is why most people are using Illumina if it's a human genome as you want to sequence uh, as many genomes from your project uh, as possible. Okay, any questions about assembly techniques before we move on to the last few minutes? Yeah? Uh, yeah, usually it has to be whole genome. Again, like like for targeted sequencing, exon exon sequencing is a, is a you know special case of targeted sequencing. And once you've you know uh, gone past where your probes have pulled down uh, the exon region, then you just don't have any coverage there, so your assembly will stop. So if you try to run an assembly on on uh, exon sequencing, you'll get you know really small little exon fragments, um, but nothing beyond that because you just don't have data there. Yeah. Uh, how does the size of your K impact your results yeah. in regards to like the length of your readings? Like how, how does that work? It's a great question. Um, it's it's really the most critical part of doing a short read assembly using a Brown graph is picking what K to use. Um, typically, if you have, you know, it depends on both how repetitive your genome is and how much coverage you have. So if you have a lot of coverage, you can use a longer K. If you have less coverage, you can use a shorter K. Conversely, if you have a really repetitive genome, you want a longer K, so fewer of your nodes in your graph will be repetitive, um, versus if you have a bacterial genome, you can use a shorter K. So there's a lot of work that's gone into programs that will automatically try to determine what K to use, and the program we're going to be using uh, just after this will automatically pick the k size after analyzing the coverage profile and the genome structure. It used to be like, you know, it used to be you'd run your assembler, uh, and you'd run it, you know, 15 times with different K values, 30, 35, 40, uh, all the way up to like 60, 70. Um, but luckily, you know, clever people figured out how to automatically do that. So you only have to run it once and it'll give you a pretty good result. Yeah. Is this error correction that assembles base quality score recalibration? So base quality score recalibration takes the reads aligned to the reference genome it looks for where the reads mismatch the reference and then it tries to adjust the quality scores to be more representative of the truth. Like a quality score is just an estimate of how accurate the sequence is. Base quality score re, uh, calibration tries to re-estimate them to, to make them a little more accurate. Um, error correction on the other hand, we're actually modifying the reads themselves. So if the error corrector thinks that there's a C at this position, it was a sequencing error, and it thinks there's a correction, it will modify the read, change that C to a G, and then you get a new set of reads, which you know hopefully has a lower lower error rate. Yeah. yeah. So for the previous question, you said that uh, for the K pairs, uh, that, uh, that software that I use today, it just predetermines the K by itself. Yeah. I just want to know what kind of criteria that looks into just decide which application before application decision. So usually like um, so for a human genome, um, you typically want camera sizes around 60, 61 in that range, you know, really quite large. I was showing short cameras just for illustration. Uh, and the determining factor is how much coverage you have of the genome. So what these automatic camera size pickers will do is that it's going to calculate an estimate of your genome coverage and then it's going to pick K depending on that estimated coverage. 
So it's going to use, you know, if it thinks you have 20x data, it's going to use a shorter camer, maybe 31. If it thinks you have 100x data, it's going to use a longer camer, 60, 70, something like that. If when you run your, the programs uh, in the tutorial part, um, the spades program is the program we're going to be using. It will give you all this output saying exactly what it's doing and why it's selecting particular cameras. All right, anything else before we move on? We just have a few more minutes left. All right, gap filling, we talked about this. Right, so um, I talked about these six different data sets that are part of the assembly fund too. I just want to highlight one of the main findings of this project, um, which was that there's basically no best assembler out there. The Assemblathon was this benchmarking project where they sequenced three different species, the fish, uh, that snake, and that, uh, that parakeet. They released those three species to the community of people who develop genome assembly software. I took part in this Assemblathon. Uh, they had us all run our, our tools, our software tools, on, the, on these genomes, send the results back to them, and they scored the individual assemblies to see who's doing best. And there's basically no assembler that did great across all different species. Some were better for the snake genome, some were better for the bird genome, uh, and the results were really quite variable. Uh, so I just want to end on some of the features of your genome or your data, uh, which might make assembly more difficult. So an obvious one is just how repetitive your genome is. So we talked about the human genome is about 50% repeats, you know, trying to do a genome assembly of uh, of a human using short reads is really quite difficult because of that 50% repeat content. Uh, another factor that's really, um, you know, not recognized as much as it should be is how heterozygous the genome is. Here, human genomes aren't so bad as there's a SNP around 1,000 bases, but for one of these genomes I showed earlier, the oyster genome, there's a SNP around every 80 bases. Now, the effect of that is that because there's so much heterozygosity, so much allelic variation, you get these bubble structures all over the assembly graph, and it makes it very, very difficult for the assembler to pick out what the true path is. So when you reach really high levels of heterozygosity, it causes a lot of problems for your, uh, for your assembler. Of course, low coverage is an obvious one. You need your genome to be very well covered. You need every base of the genome to have a read, uh, a, uh, for it to be present in some sequencing read, for it to be able to be uh, assembled. If your sequencing is biased in any way, so what we want is nice uniform coverage across the genome. If you have things like plasmodium where it's 80% AT, that can introduces a lot of coverage biases where some regions are much more difficult to sequence than others. Yeah? With regards to um, biased sequencing, um, I know with regards to MT DNA, we use the RCRS, um, which I think that's like something of like a European bias. Then okay. Then as an alternative, you have like a, a constructed sequence, like the R, S, R, S, the reconstructed sequence, the reference sequence. Right. In that regard, like how, like how much of a, like how big of a deal, or how much of an effective bias? So this, uh, that's a slightly different type of bias. So that's like a reference bias, where, you know, you're using a reference genome that's not well matched to the sample that you've sequenced. You know, if it's an African sample and you're using European copy of mitochondria, you know, then that might introduce... Uh, introduce in issues. The type of bias I'm talking about here is where some regions of your genome are going to sequence more easily or uh, or less easily so that you might have good coverage in the regions that are 50% GC but you might have poor coverage in the regions that are 20% GC uh, which is what I'm, I'm meaning by bias coverage is bias sequence. Uh, of course if your reads have a really high error rate um, it's going to be more difficult to assemble if you have chimeric reads, if reads um, are from different independent sequence uh, parts of the genome that have been uh, incorrectly merged together during sequencing, that causes all sorts of problems for assemblers. If you have sequencing adapters in the reads, like if you've overshot your fragment size, if your sample is contaminated in any way, or if you haven't just sequenced a single individual. Uh, for a lot of small things, like maybe flies, you can't get DNA from a single sample, or you maybe can't get DNA from a single sample, uh, so you need to pool DNA from multiple individuals and sequence it. That introduces a lot of heterozygosity, becomes a population assembly problem, uh, which is much more difficult to resolve. Do you have a question back there? Yeah. Yeah, so chimeric read. Uh, so during library preparation, you know, we fragment DNA, 
and we assume each fragment of DNA is from one contiguous location of the genome. What can happen, though, is that sometimes two different fragments of DNA can get ligated together and then sequenced from end to end. And if that happens, your read contains two, two distinct genomic regions, and we call that a chimeric read. Um, it looks quite a lot like a translocation to your assembler, uh, so it causes problems to, for the assembler to try to resolve that. So, you know, you, you really don't want chimeric reads in your library. All right, I think that's, uh, it's a good time to, to, to dive into the tutorial now. Um, so just to summarize, this is an overview of how assemblers work. Uh, we have different methods for short and long read assemblers. Uh, many different factors determine whether a given assembly is going to be difficult or easy. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, shoot me a message on Slack or to my uh, work email here.